Maxwell House Coffee presents Good News of 1938. Welcome to another hour behind the scenes in Hollywood, brought to you each week from Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, home of the screen's greatest stars. Imagine yourselves now walking through MGM's famous front gate, past the projection rooms and the commissary to soundstage 30. Tonight, scores of stars have come to broadcast and to listen to our good news program. You will hear music by Meredith Wilson and his orchestra, Alan Jones, Virginia Bruce, Frank Morgan, Fanny Blaze. Betty James, John Carradine, and Jimmy Stewart. And here's your host for this hour of entertainment, Robert Taylor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Lined up at the barrier to start the 15th running of the Maxwell House Good News Derby are a string of thoroughbreds. Oh, uh, Bob. <laughs> well, hello, Frank Morgan. <laughs> I, uh, I just heard you talking about racing. That's a great sport, isn't it? Oh, so you're a lover of horse flesh, too, huh? Oh, well, certainly. I What? Horse flesh? I wouldn't eat the stuff if I was starving. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do know something about horses, don't you? Oh, something. I'm an authority. Giddy ass. Whoa, see? <laughs> Why, racing's in my blood. I know all about horses. I used to be a jockey. Oh, you were, huh? Yes. Well, uh, did you pick any good ones today? Did I? Oh, Bob, she was charming. <laughs> <laughs> blonde hair and black <laughs> eyes. And... Frank, listen, what? hasn't your wife blonde hair and black eyes? Well, no wonder she came home with me. <laughs> <laughs> she is charming. Yes, I think your wife is very interesting. Yes, right? she is, in a dull kind of a way. <laughs> if she's listening, I'm only kidding. I <laughs> you know, her biggest fault is she insists on picking out my clothes. Why, just for wearing at the races, she had a top coat made for me out of an old horse blanket. It's an awful thing. I leaned over to tie my shoestring, and three jockeys jumped on my back. <laughs> I think I'll go out to the racetrack myself tomorrow. Oh, fine, Bob. Mm -hmm. I've got a good horse for you in the second race. A tip from a fellow that knows a fellow who knows a fellow that yeah, knows... Yeah, well, well, who is it? I was going to bet on Dipsy Doodle. Oh, Doopsy Diddle hasn't got a chance. <laughs> well, to bet the horse, I tell you, I've got information. You see, the horse hates the jockey, and he'll win the race trying to get away from him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, listen, I've got a good tip for you, too. Really? What is it? Well, you won't tell anybody, will you? I won't even repeat it to myself. All right. Bet on Meredith Wilson's orchestra to play I Double Dare You right now. There they go. <laughs> listeners to our Maxwell House program are seeing the new picture everybody sing this week, which means that for the first time you are seeing Fanny Bryce as Baby Snook. 
It's a thrill I'm sure none of you will want to miss because she's just as lovable, just as maddening on the screen as she is on our program. Now here she is again with Hanley Stafford as her daddy, Baby Snook. <laughs> I got Snooks off to bed. Good. Is everything set, dear? Just about. Just about. By the time your boss gets here, I'll be all ready. Well, make sure the dinner's perfect. I don't want anything to go wrong tonight. It won't. I'm going into the kitchen and see if the roast is done. <laughs> oh, Daddy! <laughs> Why, Snooks, I thought you were in bed. Go right back to bed this instant. <laughs> oh, what's the matter? You didn't sing to me tonight. Oh, all right. Sit on my lap. There. rock a bye baby on the treetop. Daddy, the wind. don't sing. For well, why? Just rock. Now, will you go right up to bed? No. Oh, please go to bed, honey. My boss is coming here for dinner. What's a boy? Well, it's the man who pays me. I work for it. Why? Why? So I can earn money. What for it? To buy clothes and food for dinner. Does the boss earn money? Why, of course he does. Well, why did you have to come here for dinner? <laughs> because I invited him. Oh. Daddy. What? I want to see your boss. You can't see my boss. Why? Because it's way past your bedtime. Next week, I I'll take you down to the office, and then you can see him. All right. Now, are you satisfied? Uh-huh. And will you go to bed? No. Nah. <laughs> well, why not? I want to see your boss. I told you, you'll see him next week. You'll just have to be patient. What's patient? Patient means being able to wait for something. Is it good to wait? Why, yes. Then I'll be patient, Daddy. That's fine. I'm going to wait till the boss comes. Now, that's not being patient. You said it was. Now, look, darling, let me explain what patience is. A little boy goes fishing. What's his name? Oh, I don't know his name. Oh. A little boy goes fishing. The little guy goes fishing? Oh, I suppose so. Why? For the same reason little boys go fishing. Will you let me explain what patience is? All right. Daddy. What is it? The fish is called fishing. No, no. Look, I'm trying to make you understand what patience is. Now, don't interrupt me again. All right. A little boy goes fishing. He waits and waits and waits. To see a boy? No. <laughs> to catch a fish. Who? The little boy. Which little boy? Any little boy. But he doesn't catch any. Any what? Any fish. Are you listening to me? Uh-huh. Well, what did I say? I don't know. <laughs> well, how can I teach you patience if you don't listen? The little boy fishes, but the fishes don't bite. Bite the little boy? No, bite the line. What line? The line on the end of his fishing pole. Ah. <laughs> the little boy doesn't give up. He waits some more. Now, what does the little boy need when he goes fishing? Wine. All right, Snooks, you go right up to bed this minute. Doing downstairs. Oh, she's impossible. Get her upstairs to bed. My boss will be here any minute, and that blubberhead hates children. Now, don't get so excited. Well, she'll wreck everything, and that tight wad will never give me a raise. Say, I, I smell something burning. <gasps> Heavens, the roast is on fire. The whole kitchen's full of smoke. Wait, I'll help you. My cat? Yeah, the one who tells jokes. 
I have no can who tells jokes. You have to. My daddy said you got a funny push. <laughs> well, tell your daddy I'm not coming to dinner, and he needs to come to work. Goodbye. I think I'll go up now. I should say you'd better. On account of you, the roast got burned and Mother had to put on three steaks instead. You ain't gonna need three steaks. The phone just called up. Oh, I, I thought I heard the phone. Who was it? Your boss. He ain't coming to dinner. Well, why not? He's got a headache. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, Mother, the boss isn't coming. Take off one of those steaks. Oh, my goodness. All right. Oh, wait a minute, Snooks. Are you sure my boss had a headache? Mm-hmm. Is that what he said? No. Then how do you know he had a headache? Because I bet I gave it to him. You gave it to him? What did you say to him? I told him you said he had a funny push and Mama said he was a tight one. Oh! Mama, take off another steak. Daddy ain't going to eat. Why not? He fainted. <laughs> Monday is Valentine's Day, ladies and gentlemen, and I know there are a lot of young ladies listening whose idea of the perfect Valentine would be to have Alan Jones sing a serenade outside their windows. It's a little early for Valentine's, but better early than never. So open the window, girls. Here comes Alan singing, I See Your Face Before Me. I see your face before me Routing my every dream There is your face before me You are my only thing It doesn't matter where you are I can see how fair you are I close my eyes and Beautiful face Beautiful 
That song, incidentally, was written by a very versatile member of the MGM family, Howard Deeks. Howard wrote the lyrics for Arthur Schwartz's songs in the Broadway show, Between the Devil. Well, I'm sorry, I will not. All I'll give you one more chance. Will you do it? No! Well, all right, Tightwad. When this gets around, I pity your rep. Socially, you're a dead pigeon. Hey, Frank. <laughs> yes, Bob? What's all this trouble with Alan? You know Alan isn't tight. Not tight? No. What would you call a man who has the jagged necks of broken bottles sold on the opening of each pocket? I say it's not only fair, Bob, that when one of our loyal friends, one of our co-workers, one of our comrades goes away on a trip, that we, his pals, get together and buy him a little gift. Well, I think you're right, Frank. Put yeah. me down for ten dollars. Oh, that's fine. Who's the gift for? Me. <laughs> the details don't matter, Bob. It's the sentiment that counts. That's a fine thing. Going around collecting money for a gift for yourself. Well, just to save you fellas the bother, I didn't want us to go to too much trouble about me. When Meredith Wilson heard I was going, he gave me a $100 check. Told me to get whatever I wanted. What are you thinking of getting with the check? Well, I'd like to get cash if it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> but you know Wilson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when are you leaving, Frank? Tomorrow. I'm driving to New York in my car. Oh, yes. I saw your new car. It's a honey. It should be. I owe enough. I mean, I paid enough for it. <laughs> it's special built, you know. <laughs> Custom body. Lovely... Chassis, Hillside 430... Oh, the car! <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Only two cars like it in the whole world. Yeah, who has the other one? Well, some fellow by the name of Jack Benny. It's a very expensive car. I owe $3,000 on it, $300 a month. I can't pay it. Well, maybe if you talk to the finance company, they'll make an adjustment. They did. They adjusted the carburetor so I can't go fast enough to escape. <laughs> You know, I'm taking the car on the boat over to Europe, Bob. Well, Frank, yeah. I better be careful about driving in Europe. In well, London, you know, they drive on the left side of the street 50 yeah. miles an hour, and stop signs don't mean a thing. Oh, they can't scare me. I learned to drive right here in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bob, this time next week I'll be boarding the SS Aquitania in New York. Are you sailing alone, Frank? Oh, no, no, I'm taking my personal maid with me. <laughs> I mean, my valet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what would I be doing with a maid? <laughs> You should meet her, Bob. She's nauseating, but nice. <laughs> should be a glorious trip. Especially Switzerland. Oh, Switzerland. The country of my misspent youth. I mean, where I spent my youth. Yeah, but Frank, I understood that as a boy, you lived in New York. New York? Well, I did live in New York, but I went to school in Switzerland. Back and forth. Yeah, like clockwork. <laughs> I remember the schoolhouse, P.S. Alp, number six. <laughs> Bob, couldn't you possibly come along to Europe with me as my guest? Plenty of room for you, Bob. I've reserved the whole upper deck of the Aquitania for myself. Nothing but the best for Morgan, I always the say. The whole upper deck. I don't believe it. You don't believe it? Why, Bob, if I'm lying, I hope the roof caves in on me. Hey, wh where are you going? Outside in the open. <laughs> Bob, the invitation is still good. With me, you'll travel in style. The Riviera, Biarritz, I'll take you to see the Leaning Tower of Pisa. No, I'd rather see the Eiffel. Oh, the Eiffel. I've got her phone number. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen her since the war. Chumps the Leezy's 4161. If a man answers, it's the same one who slugged me. <laughs> well, Bob, if you won't accept it's your loss, the trip is costing me $40,000, but I... How much, Frank? Well, Bob, if I'm lying, I hope the roof... Well, it's costing plenty. <laughs> well, Frank, look, I have but, but one favor to ask us. Well, anything at all, Bob, it's a pleasure. All right, uh, when you come back, bring me some little art treasure, some piece of sculpture. Well, now, you know, it's a funny thing you mentioned, sculpture. Do you know that when I went to school in Paris... What did you study in Paris? Uh, what did I say? <laughs> oh, I'll skip it. I'm... Bob, it's off to Europe for me. I'm off for the high seas. Well, bon voyage, Frank. Yeah, well, that's very... Hi, <laughs> <laughs> <My> boys. <laughs> Better late than... This is touching. I wish I could take you all with me. <laughs> Frank, will you answer that telephone? Yes, of course. Yeah. Hello? Uh, Frank Morgan, please. Yes, I'll see if he's in. He's... Oh, yes, I'm in. This is Morgan. Who's this? Uh, this is the Canard Steamship Lines, New York. Mr. Morgan, you can't sail on the Aquitania. I can't sail. Now, see here, I must sail. I've made all my plans. I even bought a yachting cap. Let me talk to the manager. This is the manager, and there's no room for you on the Aquitania. Maybe we can squeeze you in on the next trip. Squeeze me in? Uh, didn't you get my application? Yes, but we don't need any more stewards. <laughs> 
Well, that's a fine way to run a steamship line. Who needs the Aquitania? I can row. Where's the door? Who moved the door? <laughs> Meredith Wilson's new arrangement of the popular tune, Nice Work If You Can Get It. Pleasure to welcome her here to the Good News Program, Virginia Bruce. <laughs> Virginia appears this evening in a playlet written especially for her by George Oppenheimer called Where There's Smoke. Now I'm seeing a hotel room, time. those confounded lights. Now, here they are. Tom, Anthony, what are you doing in my room? There's nothing personal about it. Get out. Get out. Do you hear? Very well, if that's the way you feel about it. How dare you break in here? I didn't break in. The door was unlocked. It might interest you to know, June. Nothing the... you could say would interest me. Well, if that's how you're going to behave, I was just about to Will tell you... Will you get out or must I ring for the manager? I don't think they'll answer. What do you mean? They're all out watching the fire. The fire? What fire? Oh, just the fire. The hotel's burning. The hotel? Well, why didn't you tell me? Because you were very rude to me. Oh. Oh, this is terrible. And I'll turn you back while I put something on. June, this is no time for modesty. Oh, where are my shoes? No, don't you look. I'll find them. Right, I was only trying to be helpful. Turn around. All right, if you insist. Oh, it's getting hot. I can see it. That's nah, your imagination. The fire's only up to the third floor. This is the fifth. This is the fifth. Oh, quick, quick. Come on, open the door. Oh, what's the matter? It won't open. Nonsense. Let me try. I guess I know when a door's stuck. Oh, what are we going to do? Pound on the door. I'm afraid everybody's gone. Uh, the window. Were you thinking of flying down five flights? How can you stand there so calmly? Do something. Do something. All right. What do you suggest? Anything. Well, I might recite something. The boys stood on the burning deck. Have you be... gone crazy? What are you so smug about? You act as though you wanted to be burned to death. Oh, uh, doesn't matter. One way is as good as another. What are you talking about? I told you once tonight, if you wouldn't marry me, nothing matters. At least we'll die together. But I don't want to die. I'm too young to die. Oh, come now. You're all of 26. I'm 22. Will you settle for 24? There you go again, insulting me. Get out of my room. Aren't you overlooking a little detail? What detail? We're both trying to get out of your room. Oh, oh, the fire. What are we going to do? Well, you asked me that before, don't you remember? I had no suggestion whatsoever. Oh, Tom. Don't let me burn. There, there, darling. We must be brave. <laughs> I don't want to be brave. I want to be saved. Remember, June, in a moment of crisis like this, one must be brave and honest. This may be your last chance to tell the truth. Oh. Why did you refuse to marry me tonight? 
I don't like to. June, how can you tell a lie on the very brink of eternity? Oh, stop talking. Come on, June, the truth. Now, why did you refuse? Because, because I loved you. Well, now we're getting someplace. Doesn't make sense, but at least it's progress. Tom, it's getting hotter and hotter. Please do don't something. Don't change the subject. If you love me, why don't you marry me? Well, how can I marry you if we're going to get burned down with the hotel? Don't quibble. You refuse to marry me tonight. Now, why? Because you tried to bully me in foot. You just grabbed me and kissed me. You took me for granted. Oh, so that... Aren't you ashamed of yourself? No, but Tom... Well, you should be, turning down a brilliant opportunity like that just out of pique. Now, come here. What are you going to do? What do you think? Oh, Tom. June, look, if by some miracle we should get out of this, I mean alive, will you marry me tomorrow? Yes. You yes. swear it? I uh, yes, darling. Okay, that's all I want to know. But how can we get out? I don't know. I only said if. The fellow, the fellow. Oh, Tom, there's somebody there. We're saved. Oh, please, somebody, let us out. Why, Miss Furrow, this door must have been locked from the inside. Inside? Oh, but where's the fire? Well, the manager asked me to tell the guests that someone put in a false alarm. A false alarm? Yes, miss. I trust you weren't too upset. Uh, good night. Tom Anthony, did you lock that door? Yes, darling. You would have let me burn to death. No, darling. Yes, you would have, you, you pyromaniac. Oh, no, darling. What do you mean, no? You didn't know it was a false alarm. Didn't I? You? Yes, dear. Oh! Uh, uh, now, now, you must get excited. Remember, you're getting married tomorrow. I'll get even with you, Tom Anthony. I'll get even with you if it takes the rest of our married life. You were great, Virginia. But <laughs> don't you feel just a little exhausted after all that excitement? Oh, I certainly do, Bob. Well, we can fix that. A little cup of coffee is just the thing. Uh, look, you, you know Ted, don't you? Oh, I think so. He talks about Master House Coffee, doesn't he? Yeah, well, he's been known to. Mm-hmm. All right, Ted. Mm-hmm. Here's the moment you've been waiting for. Uh, Miss Bruce, Mr. Pierce. How, How do you do, do Miss Bruce? Uh, Miss Bruce, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Do you mind? No, not at all. That's fine. You know, on our good news show a few weeks ago, I talked to Mrs. Edwards, who runs the commissary on the lot. And she told me that your favorite luncheon was a chicken salad and a baked apple. And coffee. And coffee. Miss Bruce, I know what kind of coffee you drink on the lot because Maxwell House is the official coffee at the commissary. Has that friendly stimulation never lets you down. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Robert Taylor running a one-man newspaper and bringing you one news item, Flash. Next week's good news program will receive a visit from that celebrated jello salesman, Jack Benny. End Flash. But now we take you again to that little dressing room in a corner of stage 30 where we find Fanny Bryce and her maid Musette. We know Fanny is in her usual gay spirits as we hear her humming. Oh, the deep she do do went to town riding on my pony. I'm in the mood for love. Oh, Musette. Yes, it's right. Remember, Musette, tonight I'm into nobody, positively not a soul, unless it's a man. Quick, Musette, she was there. It's Frank Morgan. Yes, oh. certainly it's Frank Morgan. <laughs> At least I know it was when I knocked. I hope you're letting in the right man. <laughs> well, Mr. Morgan, it's giving me the quickening of the folks to see your smiling face grouped around me. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I just thought I'd drop in and tell you how good you were in your picture, everybody sing. I saw it the other night, and I was surprised to hear you sing so nicely. Oh, it was nothing at all. Of course, I'm used to singing the more serious type of music, the opera. Ah, yeah. oh, the opera. Yeah. You should have heard me sing the part of Stevedore and Carmen. Stevedore? You mean the Matador? Stevedore and Matador. What's the difference, so long as you're throwing the bull? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> Miss Bryce, I've always said to myself, Frank, I always call myself Frank when I speak of <laughs> <laughs> That's my maiden name. I, heard of, I, I said, Frank, you've just got to play a love scene with Fanny Bryce. Now, isn't that a coincidence? I've been saying to myself the same thing. Yeah, well, you know, I've watched you do those love scenes with all the great 
screen lovers except me, you know. Well, I, I didn't think you was exactly my type. Oh. You know, I like more the outdoor rugged kind of men. Oh, well, I'm a little rugged in spots. I mean, I... Well, I mean, I will be. I've been taking athletic lessons by mail. <laughs> you look just the same to me. I know. Oh, well, don't... I don't get the muscles till the next letter. <laughs> But, you know, I really should make a great lover. I used to be a whiz at post office. <laughs> and now you're in the dead letter department. <laughs> to be a great lover, you must be a man with sensitive emotions. Yes. One minute, your heart. Yes. The next minute, your cold. Yes. You know, like a janitor. <laughs> yeah, well, I get chill blains and hot flashes once in a while. <laughs> Would that help? <laughs> you know something, Mr. Morgan? Yes. Yeah. Suddenly, as I'm standing here looking at you, yes. flashes across my mind that thought. Yes. You know, you appeal to me. Oh. Uh, oh. Will you try out a love scene with me, and you can crush me in your arms, but good, and you can kiss me again and again. I'd kiss you again. again, again. Well, I hope my mustache doesn't bother you. <laughs> It'll tickle me to death. Wait. I must have music to get me in the mood, if you could only sing. Oh, is that all there is to it? Just singing a love song? Of course, you must have that certain technique, too, you know. Well, maybe like this. Listen. <laughs> you appeal to me. Because when I see you, I get that old feeling that's pretty good so far, isn't it? Like music to Meredith Wilson, like hot dogs to a racetrack, like, oh, just like something or other. You're indispensable. How am I doing? You appeal to me. Because you appeal, yes, you appeal, you appeal. I'm getting into a rut here. <laughs> like Mammy to Al Jolson. Like buzzing to a bee. Like Maxwell House coffee, two, three, four, one. You appeal to me. How's that? <laughs> well, it was better than wonderful. It was a mediocre. You know, I think I'll take a crack at that song. Yeah? You appeal to me. Because you don't look like a dog, but you look real to me. Like Mickey Mouse to Minnie, like Samson to the Lily, like Sauerkraut to a Winnie. You're just a glamour man. You appeal to me. Because you're just a guy that don't look like a hill to me. Like Amos Gosby Tandy. Like Clement goes with tea. Like Jimmy Stewart, Clark Gable, Clark Gable, Robert Taylor, and a few others too numerous to mention. You appeal to me. There's no denying. Ha! Oh! Ha! Oh! You appeal to me. <laughs> and now, friends, following that pleasant custom of ours on these evenings, we're inviting you all into the old Maxwell House just across the way for a friendly cup of that famous Maxwell House coffee. The coffee that's bringing these programs to you. Ted Pearson, are they ready for us? All ready, Bob. All right, friends. Plenty of room inside, so here we go through these wide colonial doors. And there's plenty of fresh coffee, too, while we're setting the stage for the second half of tonight's show. So up with that coffee time music, Meredith. <laughs> We now pause briefly for station identification. You're listening to KFI, Los Angeles. Several weeks ago, Meredith Wilson took the popular song by Amir Bistujane and made an arrangement of it that had us all tapping our feet and whistling for a long time after it was over. A lot of people mentioned it afterwards, and Meredith remarked that the same type of arrangement could be applied to any song. Tonight, he's going to try it. I selected Rosalie as the number, and here it goes. Okay, Meredith?
Gentlemen, day after tomorrow, we celebrate the birthday of the 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. You'll hear a great deal about him in the next day or two, but tonight we should like to remind you of the simple human side of this character. And so Maxwell House presents a scene from the MGM picture all you listeners helped to name a few weeks ago of human hearts. You remember that the story dealt with a country preacher and his family, principally the son, Jason, played by Jimmy Stewart. And you may remember that all through the story, Jason grew farther and farther away from the parents who had sacrificed so much for his career. Finally, while he is serving brilliantly as a medical officer in the Union Army, he is suddenly summoned to Washington by President Lincoln, played in the picture and in tonight's program by John Carradine. Jason, Jimmy Stewart, hurries to the Capitol, expecting a decoration for his work. He is ushered into the President's simply furnished, furnished office. You are Jason Wilkins. Yes, Mr. President. I want to congratulate you, Wilkins. You've been doing great things in the field. Thank you, sir. Only my share. More than your share, if what I hear is true. You've saved many lives. Well, sir, we're closer to the lines than most field hospitals, so that when a man is wounded, we're able to take care of him before complications set in. Hmm. I've received many letters praising your work. I have here a request from General Grant that you be transferred to his medical corps. Oh, I'd like that, sir. Well, we'll see. We'll see. You interest me in one particular, Wilkins. I understand you don't amputate except as a last resort. Well, there's no use crippling man, Mr. President, unless it's absolutely necessary. Quite right. Quite right. What school did you go to? What medical college? The Baltimore Free College of Surgery, sir. Must be a very good school. Sit down. Tell me about it. Oh, thank you, sir. 
Well, sir, it's not much to look at from the outside, but they have very good doctors there. They're very thorough and all that. You had a scholarship? No, sir. It's a free school. But your board and room, you had to pay that? Yes, sir. Must have had a hard time of it. Well, sir, I, I did odd jobs around the place, and and I got money from home, sir. Home? Where is home, Wilkins? It's a little town in Ohio, sir. Pine Hill. Have you any relatives? Only my mother, sir. Only your mother? No brothers or sisters? No, sir. An only son, eh? And your mother, is she well off? No, sir. She's very poor, especially after my father died six years ago. But she managed to help you. Yes, sir. She raised the money by selling things. Things? What sort of things? Well, they're old things she didn't need, sir. What were they? I like to know about such things. Well, sir, I... As I remember, there was grandfather's watch and an old silver teapot or silver spoons, a hat box, the St. Bartholomew candlesticks. They, they were old things, sir, not good for anything. How is your mother, Wilkins? In good health? Yes, sir. Is she? Why, why, I don't know, sir. You don't know? Why not? Well, to tell you the truth, sir, I, I've neglected to write. And I... But surely she writes to you. I don't think she knows where I am. What's the matter with your mother, Wilkins? No good like most mothers? She is good, sir. She must be a pretty poor sort. Else why have you dropped her like a hot stone? She must have done something terrible to you, Wilkins. What was it? I'll tell you what she did. She carried you around in her arms. More steps than you could ever count. She nursed you, covered you at night, prayed for you, cooked, washed, sewed for you, tried to teach you right from wrong. That's what she did, Wilkins. And you repay her for that with what? Silence. Silence for two long years. But I've been fighting the wars. Hasn't she? Hasn't every mother and wife and sweetheart been doing the same thing? But, Mr. Hear me, Wilkins. For two long years, your mother's heart has been torn with the thought that you might be lying wounded and dying on some battlefield. Now she's given up. She thinks you're dead. A letter from you would have saved her that. You've talked to her, sir? She wrote to me. Asked me to find your grave. She wants to see it. Put flowers on it. Sit beside it and dream of the little boy she used to hold in her arms. Oh, I'm so terribly sorry, sir. Sorry. She sold her household treasures one by one for you. Old things, you say. Not good for anything. Oh, you ungrateful fool. Listen to me, boy. There's no finer quality in the world than gratitude. And there's nothing a man can have in his heart so mean, so low in gratitude. Even a dog appreciates a kindness. Never forgets a soft word or a bone. The noblest holiday in the world is thanksgiving. And next to the creator himself, nobody deserves that holiday as much as mothers. Wilkins, sit down at my desk. The desk? Yes, sir. Here's some paper. Now, write a letter to your mother. Tell her what an ungrateful wretch you've been and how sorry you are for it. Tell her you'll write often. And keep that promise, Wilkins. From this time forward, you'll write her a letter every week. Do you understand me? If you fail, I'll have you court martial. Blow, blow thou winter white. Thou, thou art not so unkind as man's ingratitude. Freeze, freeze, thou bitter sky that does not bite so nigh. As benefit for God. Dear Mom. Jimmy Stewart, John Paradigm, at the end of the scene.
If I may say so, I, I think you played it beautifully. Thank you. Actually, the fellow that ought to be taking the bowels is Director Clarence Brown. Well, he's right here, and I think I'll ask him to say something. Clarence? Well, Bob, we had a great cast and a great script. You know, I don't believe there was ever an actor who came closer to really being Lincoln than John Carradine. Yes, that's a fact, Mr. Brown. I was really startled the first time I saw him. Clarence, you've made a lot of pictures. You go back as far as Flesh and the Devil. Last year, you directed Conquest. How do you feel about A Few Human Hearts in comparison with some of the others? Well, Bob, I don't think I'm prouder of any job in my whole career than I am with this picture. But I don't want any credit for it. The memory of Abraham Lincoln inspired the story and all of us who worked on the picture. Now, Bob, you go on with your show and let us just sit here and listen. <laughs> all right, Clarence, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to add my personal endorsement of this fine picture of human hearts. In the next few days, you'll be able to see it at one of your favorite theaters. I, I know you'll enjoy it. Now, another of our regular Maxwell House troopers whom you all like, Miss Betty James. Betty James and Alan Jones present a song from the new picture, The Girl of the Golden West. It's called, Who Are We to Say? never do get to know, and for that matter, neither do you, and that's this. What do our dogs think about it? Tonight, some of the gang brought their dogs to the broadcast, so we've hooked up our special dog on the phone, and we're going to listen to what our dogs think of it. As we pick them up, Alan Jones' dog is talking to Frank Morgan's dog. Well, well, if it isn't my old pal, Fido Morgan. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Well, wag my tail if it isn't the best police dog on our block. <laughs> Flash Jones. Ah, uh, for yourself. <laughs> well, how are things, Fido? Well, you know how it goes. A bite here and a bite there. <laughs> uh, it's not so good with me. Oh, oh. oh. So I'm sure leading a dog's life. I get blamed for everything. You know that master of mine, Alan Jones, he sings half the night, and people in the neighborhood think it's me barking. Oh, you poor dog. But at least you're not owned by that tightwad, Frank Morgan. He built me such a dinky little doghouse that I have to wag my tail up and down instead of sideways. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, I think I'll run away and let the dog catcher get me and put me in the pond. Then they'll feel sorry. Ooh. Well, they couldn't treat you worse if you were a cat. Uh, speaking of cats, reminds me, you know, I'm hungry. I could go for a couple of nice dog biscuits myself. Well, I got something better than that. I, I brought along a bone to nibble on until the program was over. 
Won't you uh, join me? Uh, I'd be delighted. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> the leavings at the Morgan House aren't like this. After all, even a dog can't eat beer bottles. Hey, say, what do you think of that new dog, dog food? Can food. Can dog food. But that master of mine, Morgan, is so absent-minded, he forgets to take it out of the can. Wow. <laughs> hey, say, here comes Bob Taylor's Great Dane. I hope he's not hungry. You know, you know how those Great Danes eat. My, doesn't he look doggy with that new collar and leash? Woof, woof. Fellas, what's a good word? <laughs> Why, hello, Rover Taylor. Glass Jones and I were just... <laughs> Glass Jones and I were just remarking how good you look in that new collar and leash. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, just a little something the boss gave me. Yeah. Of course, you know Flash Jones here, don't you, Rover? Oh, yes, we both have the same veterinary. <laughs> Well, now, for heaven's sake, please don't start talking about your operations. Oh, oh I'm, I'm tired from walking all day. Do you fellas mind if I lie down and rest my dog? <laughs> We're just sharing a bone. Woo! Will you take potluck? No, thanks. I'm on a diet, getting ready for the dog. Oh. I wonder what, what the boys at the kennel club are doing. Say, Rover, what do you hear from the mob? <laughs> Got a litter from home yesterday. Say, how is your sister? I haven't seen her since she was a pup. Oh, she's married, you know. Quite a family. Her husband's a traveling man. They don't get along very well, though. He's a holy terrier. Oh. <laughs> hey, hey, fellas, here comes Fanny Bryce's dog. Oh, that little cocker spaniel. Yeah, we better hide this bone. That dog eats like a horse. Yeah. <laughs> What do you guys eat there? Come on out with that bone. I saw you hide it. Yeah, uh, you wouldn't like it anyway, Spanny. It, well, well, it's not kosher. Who cares? I'm looking for a change of diet. <laughs> anyway, that Fanny Bryce's brother owns a delicate pet, and so all I get to eat is frankfurters. Believe me, I'm sick and tired of doggy dog. Oh, oh. <laughs> How's, uh, how's your brother, Spanny? I understand he's going around with a little French poodle. Oh, we will have... You've never seen such a hairy dog. You have to stick him with a pin in her, you know, twice to see which end bark. Speaking of barking, uh, why can't we bark out a little good old-fashioned dog hair trim shop harmony? Huh? Well, that's All right. okay. All together now, huh? Good night, doggy. Good night, doggy. Friends, you may remember on one of our Good News broadcasts, Mrs. Frances Edwards, head of the commissary and coffee shop here, explained just why you need a special grind of coffee to fit your particular method of coffee making. Well, evidently, Mrs. Edwards made the point clear, so we've had a good many letters from women commenting on it. Most of them say something like this. A while ago, I bought a glass coffee maker and began to use it. It wasn't long before I became pretty discouraged because, frankly, I just wasn't making a good cup of coffee. I couldn't understand what the trouble was until one night I heard Mrs. Edwards explaining why it is that to make good coffee by the drip method, you must use a special drip grind. It sounded like such common sense to me that I bought a pound of Maxwell House in the special drip grind, and our coffee is being just splendid ever since. Well, I'm sure that checks with the, the experience of many thousands of women. And, of course, it does make sense, too, that to make a cup of drip coffee that's always the same in flavor and strength, you need a special drip grind. Now, that's just why we offer Maxwell House coffee in two grinds. The regular grind for those who make their coffee by the percolator or boiled method, 
and the special drip grind for glass coffee maker or drip pot. And remember, Maxwell House coffee is packed in that familiar blue super vacuum can from which all air has been removed and into which no air can get afterwards to steal away its flavor. So it reaches you with all its original full flavor intact, not merely days fresh, but roaster fresh. Thus, whatever your method, you'll be sure of getting a rich, full-bodied, deeply satisfying cup of coffee every time. Coffee that's always good to the last drop. Now, another presentation of the MGM Concert Hall. Last week, Meredith Wilson completed his series of ten immortal fa- of ten immortal favorites. Tonight, he starts a new series of popular masterpieces. And for his first number, he has chosen a composition which 20 years ago was on almost every piano in America. A song whose title most of you have probably forgotten, but whose melody I'm sure you'll remember instantly. It's called Mercedes. <laughs> Beautiful, Meredith. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, another hour behind the scenes in Hollywood brought to you from Metro Golden Mayor. Your ticket of admission is just your loyalty to Maxwell House Coffee, so be sure and tune in and hear Fanny Bright, Frank Morgan, Alan Jones, and Meredith Wilson. We'll also have with us again Maureen O'Sullivan, Lionel Barrymore, and Jack Conway, who directed us in a Yank at Oxford over in England last summer. And that famous jello salesman, Jack Benny. So, I hope you'll be with us next Thursday. In the meantime, go to the movies and enjoy yourself. This is Bob Taylor saying good night until next week. Flash! We 
salute the San Francisco Chronicle, who are honoring Fanny Bryce by starting a Baby Snooks contest. The musical selection always and always from the Joan Crawford Spencer Tracy picture mannequin. Nice work if you can get it. It's from the picture Damsel in Distress. You appeal to me. It's from Happy Land. Ted Pearson saying good night for the makers of Maxwell House, the coffee that's always good to the last drop. This is the National Broadcasting Company.